Hello everyone, my name is Gary O'Mealy, and in this video we are going to talk about thermoregulation. This lecture is going to be a mixture of ideas that we've already talked about back in our very first lecture on homeostasis, and then a couple of extra new ideas from your general biology days that I think is going to tie everything together and give you a good appreciation for sources of heat in the body and how heat is lost from the body and how the body coordinates things in homeostatic mechanisms to make sure that we strike a good balance between heat gain and heat loss. Okay, so let's start by uh, summarizing what we already know. So we know for sure that the body maintains a set point core temperature of 37 degrees Celsius. You'll hopefully recall that that's equivalent to about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And with the set point of 37, we have an allowable normal range of about 36.5 to 37.5. So again, the idea here is that we don't want our core body temperature getting much cooler than 36.5 or much warmer than 37.5. So regulation of our core body temperature is necessary, as we've discussed before, because it helps to preserve the efficiency of all of our metabolic reactions for which enzymes catalyze and speed up those reactions. We know that enzymes, being proteins, are extremely sensitive to high temperature. So if the temperature in our body gets too high, then those enzymes start to denature because of broken hydrogen bonds, and then they can't catalyze those reactions anymore, and those reactions reactions become a lot slower. If the temperature gets too low, the enzymes are functional, but molecules and substrates are moving around much more slowly, so again, reactions are going to be slower. So 37 degrees Celsius represents kind of the sweet spot in which molecules are moving fast enough for uh, reactions to go quickly, and the enzymes are actually functional. So let, now let's talk about sources of heat in the body. What are places or uh, things that can actually cause heat to be generated and warm us up. So first, any chemical reaction that involves the transfer of energy is going to produce heat. Most of these reactions are going to involve either the synthesis of ATP or the hydrolysis of ATP. So if you go back to general biology, you hopefully had a discussion on the laws of thermodynamics. Uh, we want to focus particularly on the second law of thermodynamics, which basically says that no energy conversion process is going to be 100% efficient. So the idea here is that if, for example, you eat a meal, you digest your food, and you metabolize your food, and your cells try to harness glucose or fatty acids to produce ATP, the energy that is tied up in glucose or that fatty acid is not going to be 100% transferred into ATP. What you'll see in just a second is we'll be lucky to get 40% efficiency. But whatever energy is not preserved is going to be lost as unusable heat. And the idea, obviously, is that when that heat radiates from the reaction, that heat is going to raise our core body temperature. So let's consider glucose again. We know that glucose is the most common substrate for cellular respiration in the body. The brain absolutely requires it. We've talked about that before. We talked about that in our very uh, previous video. So let's use glucose as a good example here. Okay, so the chemical bonds of glucose contain a total of 686 kilocalories per mole of energy, okay? So let's say that we input one mole of glucose, so that's uh, 6.022 times 10 to the 23 molecules of glucose. Uh, so let's say we input a mole of glucose into an actively respiring tissue. What we want to know once that tissue harnesses the glucose and starts feeding it through the reactions of cellular respiration, how much energy is actually going to be produced in the form of ATP? So you learned previously that one glucose molecule through cellular respiration and oxidative phosphorylation is going to lead to about 36 molecules of ATP. So we also know that each ATP molecule will contain a total of 7.4 kilocalories of energy per molecule, okay? So if we do a little bit of quick math here, 
7.4 kilocalories per ATP times 36 ATP molecules produced per glucose per run of cellular respiration, that's a total of 266 kilocalories of energy that are produced in the form of ATP from one glucose. So you'll recall that one glucose molecule contains a total of 686 kilocalories of energy. So in the process of cellular respiration, we have actually only maintained 38% of that energy in a usable form, that usable form being ATP. So what we want to know, obviously, is, okay, well, where does the remaining 62% go? Well, the second law of thermodynamics tells us that it is dissipated as heat. Heat is a form of energy that cannot be used by uh, the metabolic reactions of our cells. So it is, it basically serves no purpose other than to be radiated out of our body and to transiently increase our body temperature. So remember that because that's going to come into play here in just a little bit as we make our way through this lecture. Okay, so again, any metabolic reaction that involves energy transfer, such as ATP or GTP or phosphocreatine, which we'll be talking about later when we get to muscle physiology. Anything that involves energy transactions is going to produce heat. So a good example of this is skeletal muscle contraction is actually going to use a lot of ATP. Again, another idea that we will explore heavily when we get to chapter 10. Okay, so if you're using your muscles, whether it's lifting weights or going for a run or any kind of exercise, those muscles are using a lot of ATP. So that utilization of ATP represents a very significant transfer of energy. And what we just saw in the previous slide is that any sort of biological process that involves a transfer of energy is going to produce heat. So again, if you're talking about muscle contraction during exercise, this helps to explain why you experience an increase in body temperature when you exercise. And this is why you sweat when you exercise. It's because that heat that is radiating from those metabolic reactions, that heat increases your body temperature and then your body's natural homeostatic response is to try to sweat to bring that body temperature back down to make sure that our body doesn't overheat and make sure that our proteins and our enzymes don't denature. Okay, so in terms of where the heat that we produce goes, heat produced by the body will naturally be lost through a variety of different mechanisms. 18% of heat will be lost through conduction and convection. 60% will be lost through infrared radiation. And the evaporation of water on the skin the sweating process that we've talked about makes up the remaining roughly 22%. So therefore, we can conclude that our collective metabolisms that produce heat on a constant regular basis, this is going to be the major mechanism by which we keep our bodies warm enough to function, okay? So we need our bodies and our metabolic reactions to produce this heat because that keeps our body temperature up. But what we can see from the statement in the uh, top of this slide, that heat is naturally going to be lost through these three different mechanisms. So a big part of homeostasis that we need to consider here in the thermoregulation process is not just the production of heat from our metabolisms, but also uh, the loss of heat through conduction, convection, infrared radiation, and evaporation of water. So we need to make sure that heat production and heat loss are balanced. Okay, so let's introduce a somewhat new topic, although this I'm certain is something that you've at least heard of before. Basal metabolic rate. So your basal metabolic rate represents the amount of energy that is used by your visceral internal organs, like the heart, like your digestive tract, etc., etc. Uh, so this is the amount of energy used by these organs in the body in a post-absorptive state. So remember, that is the, uh, uh, the post-absorptive or uh, uh, fasted state at rest, okay? So the way I like to think about this is imagine that you are lying in bed in the morning. It's been, let's say, eight or nine hours since you've eaten anything. You're laying in bed, and let's say that you make the decision that you are not going to move all day. You're going to lie in bed 
for a complete 24 hour period, you are not going to move a muscle. The only thing going on in your body is that your brain is functioning, your heart is functioning, all of your internal organs are functioning, but you are not going out of your way to do anything extra. Your basal metabolic rate represents the energy consumption by your body in this 24 hour period, okay? So when people uh, go on diet and exercise regimens, uh, an important part of the calorie counting process to help formulate ideas about whether you're gonna be losing weight or gaining weight in a given day or uh, breaking even is to uh, get a good estimate of your basal metabolic rate because this basically represents the number of calories that your body would burn throughout the day if you did nothing. So if you do exercise on top of what you would nor ordinarily be doing, then those are just extra calories that you're burning on top of your basal metabolic rate. So BMR is kind of a funny thing. It varies from person to person. If you've ever heard someone say, oh, I'd kill for his metabolism or her metabolism, th that's the sort of thing they're talking about. So everybody is a little bit different due to genetic factors, body mass, height, gender, body mass, so things like that. So body, body, uh, basal metabolic rate does vary from person to person, but it can be estimated by factors that we just mentioned like body mass, height, gender. Genetic factors are extremely difficult to account for. Uh, and it is also related to thyroid hormone production. So we'll talk a little bit about that today, but we'll talk about it a lot more in chapter 17 when we actually start talking about particular hormones and the endocrine system. So like I mentioned before, BMR is often utilized in determining the amount of calories that are needed to be consumed in order to lose or gain weight when dieting. Okay, so in the thermoregulation process, let's summarize what we already know. So sources of heat production in the body, your basal metabolism, the consumption of food. So when you digest and metabolize your food, that of course is going to produce heat. And then skeletal muscle contraction, whether you're going out of your way to exercise or just kind of tonic muscle contractions that happen regardless of what you're doing or not, uh, these are all going to produce heat in the body. These are all going to be things that will want to raise your body temperature. As far as sources of heat loss go, we of course have our convection and conduction, infrared radiation, uh, and then blood redistribution and water evaporation, which are concurrent processes that occur as part of the homeostatic response to your body temperature being too high. And this, of course, includes sweating. Okay, so let's talk uh, body system-wise, homeostasis-wise, in terms of what's going on with thermoregulation. We've mentioned before that the hypothalamus, which is a component of your brain, is kind of the uh, center hub of thermoregulation in the body. So the hypothalamus contains the uh, thermoreceptive sensory neurons that are actually going to be constantly monitoring your core body temperature. As we discussed back in chapter one, the hypothalamus is going to be kind of at the center of orchestrating these different negative feedback mechanisms to make sure that we are responding appropriately to changes in body temperature, regardless of whether it's an issue of your body temperature being too high or your body temperature being too low. What we're gonna see on the next couple of slides is that the actual response that we want the body to have is going to be very different depending on whether your body temperature is too high or too low. So let's start with the idea that, okay, your body temperature is too low. Let's say you're, going, you're outside during the winter months, it's cold, your body temperature is starting to fall. What is your body going to do about it? So before we go any further, I want you to make sure that you are good on your homeostasis principles, including all the components of a regular negative feedback loop. That includes stimulus, sensor, control center, effector, response, and the lines of communication connecting the sensor to the control center and the control center to the effector. So if anything about that sounds unfamiliar to you, go back to lecture one and watch it again. Review your homeostasis again because you need to make sure that you have that down. 
Okay, so if we're talking about thermoregulation when your body temperature drops, the stimulus is obviously that your body temperature is too low. So again, you can kind of see the example here, uh, snowflakes indicating cold temperatures, so your body temperature starts to naturally drop because your metabolic reactions can't produce enough heat to counterbalance the loss of heat from your body due to the temperature outside. So we know the sensor here is going to be the hypothalamus. We can see these temperature sensitive receptor cells in the hypothalamus that are going to stimulate and orchestrate these heat producing mechanisms. Uh, the control center is going to be also the hypothalamus as well as kind of other parts of the brain that are going to get involved such as uh, some of the cortical cells of the frontal lobe. That's not super important right now. So for now we can just kind of say the brain including the hypothalamus. But as far as what the effectors are, don't forget the effectors are going to be cells or tissues or organs that are going to actively do something to counter the initial stimulus. So if the initial stimulus is that the body temperature is too low, we want our effectors to be cells or tissues or organs that can respond by either producing heat or redistributing things in the body to prevent heat loss. So our major effectors here are going to be vascular smooth muscles. So we can see here that superficial arteries in the skin are constricted, so that's vasoconstriction, that reduces heat loss due to the air. So that's not a case of us producing more heat, that is actually a strategy meant to minimize heat loss. Our next uh, effector is skeletal muscles, so we know what the shivering process is all about. So the hypothalamus sends neural messages to muscle all throughout the body and these muscles involuntarily contract. That uses up ATP, and we just saw how utilization of ATP causes heat radiation, so that will actually produce heat to warm the body up. And then the thyroid is the last effector here. It will be stimulated to start producing thyroid hormone, and thyroid hormone is something that we will explore in chapter 17 that can actually increase your basal metabolic rate, actually increase heat production by stimulating cellular respiration all throughout your body, making new ATP and causing new heat radiation. So all of these things collectively are either going to cause a rise in your body temperature or prevent your body temperature from decreasing any further. So collectively, uh, we stem the tide of the body temperature being too low. On the other hand, if the body temperature is too high, we're going to see very much the opposite. Okay, so again, the sensor here are, is the hypothalamus, including its thermoreceptive sensory cells. Control center is the hypothalamus and other regions of the brain. Your effectors here are going to be kind of simu similar. So we have vascular smooth muscle again. In the case of the vascular smooth muscle, we are going to dilate the arteries to stimulate extra loss of heat because if the body temperature is too high, we need to make sure that we are ridding the body of that excess heat. The sweat glands, of course, will be stimulated, so we want to get a good lather of water on the surface of the skin so that when we do radiate that heat, that heat is used to evaporate the water and that will make the heat loss and heat radiation more efficient. And then the thyroid here will actually be uh, inhibited. Uh, we will, it, it will be told to reduce the production of thyroid hormone to make sure that we're not going overboard on producing new heat. So in that case, we will reduce heat production to make sure that we're not increasing the body temperature any more than it already is. So of course, collectively, the response here is that the body temperature will drop, which of course makes sense because the initial stimulus was that the body temperature is too high to begin with. Okay, that is going to do it for this video. I hope that you have a better appreciation for the dynamics at play in terms of body temperature, heat production, heat loss, heat radiation, and things like that. Uh, here is a list of vocabulary terms I think you ought to be aware of. And then for checking your understanding, number one, why do metabolic reactions naturally produce heat? Number two, what would be the consequence for our cells if proper thermoregulation is not maintained? And number three, why are separate mechanisms of sweating and shivering necessary and required?
All right, that's going to do it for this video. If you have any questions at all, feel free to drop a comment in the comment section. Otherwise, I will see you next time. So long.